Hey, good morning everyone. I'm deciding to make you all a surprise video where I give you a very low IQ take on some of the things that happened at G7. Um, so, <clears throat> remember when last G7 happened and the picture with Donald Trump was going around the media and they were hyper-analyzing it? I really don't like taking one picture which could make someone look out of context and then starting to hyper-analyze it and look into it more than you should. Um, but the media did so nonetheless. And for some reason, they're not doing the same uh, when it comes to this year, G7. Uh, so, so allow me to do it. Allow, allow me to try to be more like the media. Allow me to be more like a journalist. And I'm looking at this picture and I, I find it a little bit dystopian. If I do say so myself, it's just like really bizarre. Um, first of all, it's the background looks like something of a Mad Max picture. <laughs> I don't know if, if that's just me, but, but it seems like it's so forced. Like everyone feels kind of uncomfortable, like they're staying where they're supposed to be standing and they're forced to crack a smile, even though they're not necessarily happy. It, it's pretty much like the smoke and mirrors type of politics that we're seeing today. It's, it's very much of theater. I mean, look, they're all standing apart because they're social distancing, right? But then you look at another picture and they're not social distancing. And I assume like most of these people are vaccinated anyway. So when I look at pictures like this, it's just like so much theater. It, it, it is pretty much the way, quote unquote, democracy is happening nowadays, especially in Europe. Like you get a rubber stamp here, you get a signature there, everything in order to make it look as democratic as possible. But in reality, you get like bureaucrats. Um, which I don't really controlled by the people. I mean, I as a European citizen have pretty much no power to uh, decide that I don't want Ursula von Leyen to lead anymore, that, that I, I don't like her as a leader. Because, for example, Americans can impeach their president, um, and of course Americans can vote for their president, but Europeans don't directly vote for Ursula von Leyen, and Europeans can't do anything about her if she decides to uh, make some really radical propositions. And that's pretty much it. You know, like you, you get to look at uh, G7 and you see like uh, European leaders such as Merkel, such as Macron, uh, such as uh, Boris Johnson. And then you also see Ursula von Leyen there. It's like, why, why is she there? I imagine like you were to see in America, you get to see Joe Biden right, representing the US. But then you also see Governor DeSantis next to him. And and then you get to see newsmen and other governors uh, representing the U.S. at an international stage. It's just weird. It's just bizarre. It's like either you have Ursula von Leyen, I guess, representing the European Union, or you have the leaders of the European Union. Like that, I, I just don't understand why you'd have both. I just don't understand why you'd have Angela Merkel, Boris Johnson representing um, the European nations in an international committee as well. Like, well, what if they disagree with Ursula von Leyen? What do you do then? But I guess like this is how they're being showed to the world that they're not disagreeing, that, that everything just happens, that all these people just agree with each other on everything. There is no disagreement anymore, right? There was some disagreement when Trump was there, um, but like these leaders are now a unilateral bloc and they just agree with everything. It just so happened that the voter in France agrees 100% with the voter from Britain, which agrees 100% with the voters from Brussels. And they also agree with the voters from the United States. That, that, that's pretty much what this is being shown. And um, I, I find it very disingenuous. Right? Like it, it's very difficult to believe that this is the case. Now, uh, one of the most interesting things that I saw at G7 was a little bit of theater, because th this is pretty much what it is, right? It's just theater. A little bit of theater that they're going to uh, have a more combative relationship with China, right? And they're going to look at the Belt and Road Initiative and the EU is going to propose something else uh, and is going to, to upset China's plans economically. And China lashes back and they say that the time where a couple of nations decide the future of the world has uh, long passed. You know, like on, on the surface, when you look at the theater, it, it looks as if um, China is not represented in G7 and the, the economics between G7 and China do not align, right? Uh, but then you read something from Reuters, which uh, is supposed to, to make everyone wonder 
and it's supposed to make people question whether or not uh, the people from G7, the representatives from G7, uh, have the best interests of uh, their people in mind. Because one of the things that they're pointing out is that they want to pass a minimum corporate tax rate of at least 15%. Now, I'm not an economist, okay? I'm, I'm not an expert when it comes to taxation. Uh, but I do get upset, even though I'm not a leftist. I do get upset when I see articles in the media showing that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk don't pay their fair share. Okay, like I don't think corporations should pay 900% of tax. I'm not on the corporations should pay 90% of tax train. You know, the rich, the 1% should pay like almost everything they have in tax. I'm not really part of that train. But at the same time, I do think that they should pay at least the bare minimum. You know, they, they should pay at least what I'm paying in taxes. Um, in percentage, I mean, not, not in what I'm paying. Because obviously, uh, Jeff Bezos probably pays more than me. Um, when it comes to the flat sum, but still, you know, like there's, there's a lot of loopholes and there's a lot of ways that corporations avoid paying taxes. And because of that, you now have G7 saying, it's like, okay, let, let's have like a 15%, um, uh, share rights to tax the biggest companies. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know, but what do you do with the other countries? Like, what do you do with places that don't have the 15%? Like, well, what do you do with a country that's, I don't know, in Zimbabwe, for example, right? Like, well, what, what if a company wants to have its headquarters in Zimbabwe uh, in order to avoid your 15% tax? Because Zimbabwe is not in G7. And apparently, I don't even have to ask that because it seems that China is not going to be part of this initiative to tax corporations 15%. And, and I don't think it takes... Um, a huge economist to figure out that if you're a large company that wants to avoid taxes and you want to find loopholes, you now have a big incentive in order to go to China, to set your headquarters there and uh, to produce stuff there in order to avoid whatever the G7 is regulating. Because it's not it's not just about like the 15%, right? It's also the mindset. Because now you, you have like these governments that have a mindset in order to specifically target large corporations. And if it, you're a large corporation, you realize, okay, well, this year they, they passed this. What's to stopping them from passing something more draconic next year? What's to stopping them from passing more regulation next year? And a lot of people like don't understand. It's like, okay, V, so what if they move to China? Like, what, what's your problem? Like, well, it's a good thing if corporations are in your country so you can have access to jobs. If the jobs move somewhere else, then, well, unemployment goes up. Duh. I mean, it, it, and it's not just unemployment goes up, but like the mom and pop stores in your country still suffers because the products made in China are then exported back into your country. And the mom and pop store now have to compete with the things that are made in China. So it's not, it's not necessarily a good thing. Eh? Um, and just because it might be good for the economy, because that's usually the center left is take. Well, if it's good for the economy, it's good for me. If it's good for the economy, it doesn't necessarily mean that it trickles down into your pocket. So apparently with the foundations for a global tax uh, laid by G7, officials are limbering up for a clash over exemptions and other carve-outs for specific industries and specific economic zones with China at the center. The group of seven wealth tax industry states agreed on June 5th to support a minimum corporate tax rate of at least 15% and how to share rights to tax the biggest companies operating across the borders in their countries. But the official communique from G7 finance ministers has made no mention whether exceptions and exemptions should be made in broader talks underway, leaving a critical question hanging. If you want to enforce minimum taxation, you could take a view that no carve-outs should be made because you should impose the minimum tax, but that is not realistic. So in other words, what they're saying is that this is happening all the time uh, within actual governments. Like you, you will have a government that's making some draconic legislation or even a state in the US is making some draconic legislation and corporations just move. They, they just look at the bill and they realize, okay, well, it's more expensive for us to stay in this state. It seems that the legislator in this state is more in favor of regulation. So we're just going to do our business elsewhere. And is it surprising that when it comes out to doing global politics, the politicians don't take this into account? They don't talk about it? They, 
Be because I, I generally think that most of these legislations are made by bureaucrats rather than the politicians themselves. Like, I, I think the politicians are just mouthpieces. They're like the representative of bureaucrats. They're not the actual people making the legislation. Most of the time, they even admit that this is the case. So, you know, it's a little bit worrisome. Um, but I guess we'll see in the future. You know, uh, personally, I think, and this is my prediction, that if this passes and, and if it's enforced exactly in the way they talked about, you're just going to see more companies move, not necessarily to China, but they're going to move to Asia. They're going to move to other places. Um, and you're going to have a rise in unemployment during a time of economic crisis, which is definitely coming. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section, and I'll see you all there.